The CU Athletics Program, which also happens to have a university attached to it, is moving. Next year, CU Sports will once again play in the Big 12, the conference it left in 2011 to join the Pac-12. On the academic side, this is not going to lower your tuition, but on the athletic side, it could mean truckloads of money. This, I want to show you the resolution that CU Regents approved unanimously. That resolution includes a part that says the Big 12 provides more national exposure in optimal TV windows while mitigating team travel burdens. That's a lot of verbose. Which does and, is, does and doesn't. Let's, I want to show a map if we can. Do we, if we don't have the map, it's fine. I can explain that the Pac-12, the farthest CU had to travel in the Pac-12, there's that part of the resolution, and the map's coming next. The farthest CU had to travel in the Pac-12 was Seattle and the University of Washington, 1,317 miles away. In the Big 12, the farthest CU will travel is Orlando for the University of Central Florida, 1,844 miles, then 1,400 miles for West Virginia. However, travel to the schools in the rest of the conference is generally closer than the rest of the schools in the Pac-12. And as Athletic Director Rick George points out, playing schools to the east of us means earlier game times. We've done our analysis, and, and they'll, they'll be traveling less in the Big 12, playing in more favorable time slots where we believe they can get greater national exposure and return to Boulder after away games at earlier times. Pac-12 games were often branded Pac-12 after dark, which meant really early in the morning return flights home. The Big 12 put out a news release on CU rejoining the conference. We love news releases, so let's, let's read it. We're going to put it on the screen. They're back. That's it. Two words. Ariel or pseudo is also two words, and Ariel is in Boulder tonight. Uh, when CU left the Big 12 in 2011, the conference withheld almost $7 million bucks, Ariel, essentially a buyout that the Pac-12 then covered in a loan to CU. So is the Pac-12 now returning the favor and withholding money from CU this time around? You know, they do not have to pay that buyout because their contract actually ends next year. So it'll expire and then they'll immediately pick up a new contract with the Big 12. So that's a pretty, pretty convenient timing for them to join in 2024, Marshall. Leave, if you're ever going to leave somewhere, it's good to do it at the end of the contract. Uh, I want to talk about Coach Prime. Would he, I don't know if you know this or not, would he have come to a Big 12 Colorado football team versus a Pac-12 Colorado football team? Yeah, I think he absolutely would because, you know, th in the Big 12, the new Big 12 especially, he has all these schools in Texas. You mentioned uh, Central Florida down there. That's a great spot in Orlando to have recruiting. All the Texas schools, that's where he gets so many of his recruits from, especially Houston now is part of the Big 12. Huge recruiting area. I think it absolutely is a great spot for him. I think he would have absolutely come to a school that was part of the Big 12 plus Plus, Pac-12 no longer has a media rights deal right now. Currently, the Big 12 has a new one going through 2031 with Fox and ESPN, and it's a big one. I think a big winner is, is you or whoever covers CU going forward because November in Ames, Iowa, and November in Cincinnati, so much better than November's in L.A. and Tempe, really. Honestly, I think it's going to feel about the same as it does right now. Like I'm sitting in a downpour. So I think really what's better weather than this or Ames, Iowa in November? Come Marshall. inside. I'll stop talking to you. Thanks, Ariel. <laughs> We've talked a lot about secrecy in politics lately. Like who's behind the Aurora Strong Mayor ballot issue? The mayor. The Denver School Board that talked about public business in private and state lawmakers accused of making decisions in private, which has now led to another lawsuit. Conservative group Advanced Colorado is suing state lawmakers over a practice called quadratic voting. KUNC was the first to report on the widespread use of a secret ballot system earlier this year. It's basically an anonymous survey that the Democrats use to gauge which bills are popular and which should be budget priorities. Democrats have defended the policy by saying it's not used for final votes, just planning. The lawsuit asks a district court judge to ban that practice and require pass votes to be made public. It's the second lawsuit over transparency at the state capitol this summer. Democratic representatives Elizabeth Epps and Bob Marshall are suing both parties in the state house, saying they violated open meetings law by holding private meetings and using self-deleting apps to discuss legislation. Our Excel coverage has been guided by customers who feel the company is doing them wrong. Today's coverage is about its employees who think the company is doing them wrong. 
2,000 Colorado electrical workers could go on strike when the agreement between the union and Excel expires in three days. Negotiations resumed yesterday, the 24th meeting, almost as many meetings as Excel stories I've done this year. What's the sticking point? Union members say a proposed 13% wage increase over three years is not enough to keep up with Colorado's cost of living. The union also wants voluntary overtime and more transparency about what's going to happen to employees as Excel shuts down coal plants. Union members have not voted to strike yet, but the contract expires Sunday. Negotiations are scheduled to continue today and tomorrow. More union news. Employees at a youth shelter in Denver have voted to form a union. They believe it's the first time shelter employees in Colorado have done so. The staff at Urban Peak, a shelter serving unhoused youth across the metro area, voted to join a local health care union this week. Quick full disclosure, you helped Urban Peak in a previous word of thanks. In their announcement, Urban Peak said they're dealing with high turnover, inadequate training, and a lack of resources. They also said the job is physically and emotionally demanding and that they need more trauma support. Unlike Excel, the two sides here have met zero times. Even with semi-regular rain, fire season is year-round, and there's a fire burning and growing in Gunnison County. The low-line fire started yesterday, and as of this morning, was up to 720 acres. That's about one square mile. The fire is about 11 miles southwest of Crested Butte. Firefighters said it's threatening about 10 buildings with no containment yet. They believe it was started by lightning. Hike a 14er, and the only thing you might expect to sign is the cardboard that says what mountain you're on and the elevation. In Park County, you'll now have to sign a legal document accepting the risk to hike a popular trail. The guy who owns much of the trail told our Steve Steger it's a compromise to keep it open to everyone. It's an easy way to bag four 14ers at once, mounts Democrat, Cameron, Lincoln, and Bross. Note up here is the Decalibron Loop, a trail that's been closed for much of the year. If anything that we have in our small mountain town for being a tourist attraction are those trails right up there. Sam Galgun is the mayor of nearby Alma, Colorado, the highest town in Colorado. He says the trail's closure has been devastating for tourism in town, like the town's hostel and Alma's aptly named town store. All Marts, they've definitely seen an impact as well. What a great name for a store. My Walmart. goodness. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have a Walmart, but we have an Allmart. <laughs> yeah. I just said it's not it's not worth the challenge any longer to leave myself exposed to that type of liability. John Ryber owns much of the land under the trail here and made the decision last year to close it after the results of a court case. It's a decision I don't make lightly. The Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals gave $7.3 million to a cyclist who was injured after hitting a pothole on the Air Force Academy trails. Colorado state law doesn't necessarily protect private property owners from liability for the people who hike through their land. That ruling scared Ryber enough to buy liability insurance. And uh, the insurance uh, more than doubled this year. So he closed so the trail until he could come to a compromise with a coalition of groups supporting 14ers. There's a new sign with a QR code asking anyone hiking to sign a waiver of liability if they get injured. It helps me if someone were to fall. Uh, we've done everything that we can to warn them and then we've given them a method to be able to climb on the mountain. A temporary fix while Ryber and others lobby the state legislature again to change the law to better protect landowners. The trail reopens on Friday. It would be just as easy, maybe easier to just leave it no trespassing, but I've had the opportunity most of my life to be up there. I always appreciated, uh, appreciated being up there. And I think other folks do as well. So therefore, uh, I work to try and figure out a way to make that happen. So maybe you're asking, what happens if someone doesn't sign that waiver? What Ryber believes that the signage actually protects him from liability because people know what they're getting into. And he thinks a judge or jury would agree that someone knew what they were getting into if they sue. He also says that he tested that QR code today, Marshall. And it worked because cell phone is, you know, cell signals are spotty up there, but it worked. Oh, so I can't use the excuse that either one, there's no Wi-Fi up here, so I couldn't get through, or I don't take my cell phone but with me hiking. Here's the, here's the thing I keep thinking about with this. Like, I've done this before, right? Like, you take that risk. You know it's a risk to you. 
I don't know that I would look up, hey, who owns this trail? Like, how dare they put a rock there that I tripped over? <laughs> I, you know, like that just... But, Earth put the rock there is what most people probably think. Yeah, we're but such a litigious society. It's amazing that I, I still second guess like that it's not just public, that it yeah. is privately owned by somebody. Yeah, you know, and I asked him about that. Why hold on to this if there's such a liability there? He said, obviously, he loves the land. It's been part of his family forever. But there's also, you know, mining there, which may become more valuable as years go by. And mm -hmm. there's a new need for precious metals. So... All right. He's keeping it for that. Don't skip out on the QR code. Yes. Take your phone. Scan it. Thanks, Steve. Beep, boop, bop. With Larry Curley and Mo, a Colorado retirement community finds a high-tech solution to staffing shortages. And the story of the loneliest sports conference in Colorado. Kind of. Next. Here's a pro tip. Don't drain your daughter's kiddie pool at dusk. Because this is a family show, I will not subject you to the welts I have since I'm apparently the preferred blood type of mosquitoes. Okay, maybe it's not just me. Colorado's mosquitoes love standing water and there's lots of it to go around after an especially wet, cool spring. That's especially good news for a type of mosquito called the Culex mosquito, which lays its eggs on top of standing water. Goody! <laughs> They're an extra large portion of the mosquito population this year, which could be a concern for public health leaders. Culex mosquitoes are the state's most prominent carrier of West Nile virus. MSU Denver's mosquito man, Dr. Bob Hancock, says Culex mosquitoes are thriving this year, but it's too soon to tell how that will impact the transmission of West Nile virus. I'm getting itchy now. The state routinely tests samples of the mosquito population called pools to predict how prominent the virus is each year. We never have a crystal ball for West Nile virus in our state. We do have, at this point in time, um, a fairly normal number of uh, what we call positive mosquito pools. Even though we have epic numbers of mosquitoes, it doesn't look right now like the positive pools, uh, um, the distribution of them is, is, is very much different at this point. Is, is anyone else itchy right now? So only two people have tested positive for West Nile so far this year, La Plata and Larimer counties. But Colorado typically ends the year with a relatively uh, a high case count compared to other states. Last year, we were second in the nation with 206 human cases. Lauren, I just want to... Stop talking about mosquitoes immediately. Yeah, and you know, I'm right there with you. I get all of these bites and they're, I love summertime, but that's probably one of the downfalls of summertime is all of the mosquito bites. Right now we're at 87 degrees. Temperatures have cooled down a little bit. We do have some very brief but gusty sh uh, showers and storms pushing through. Dew points at 46 degrees. Winds coming in from the south at around 10 miles per hour. Further west, we do still have an air quality alert in effect until Friday, and this is going to be for that wildfire there in Gunnison County. So you do want to be aware of those high levels of wildfire smoke. Now, and now we take a look at our HD Doppler radar. We do have these very brief scattered storms, a lot like what we saw yesterday. They're now pushing their way from the high country through the foothills into the front range and even in southern portions of the eastern plains. So as we take a closer look into the Denver metro area, we are starting to see these storms roll their way through the foothills, making their way right into downtown Denver here soon. So we're just going to watch for these storms to bring some heavy down pours and strong gusty winds. That's about it. Can't rule out maybe some small hail, but overall we're just going to watch for the winds, maybe up to 50 miles per hour and those locally heavy downpours. Denver, uh, northern portions of the Front Range, central and southern portions of the Eastern Plains under marginal risk for severe weather, and that's going to be why. Maybe some hail possibilities, but again, your biggest threats are going to be those locally heavy downpours and gusty winds. Tonight we're going to stay mostly cloudy. We're going to continue to watch for those very scattered but brief storms to move through overnight lows near 63 degrees and over the next couple of days this very hot summertime weather sticks around we're going to hold some chance for those afternoon storms to stick around through the rest of the seven day forecast before we cool down next week i feel like they're our children they kind of help us they're robots not the people talking uh robots with a personal touch a colorado retirement community welcomes some high-tech helpers and you already know one business that's off Arapaho Road and Emporia Street, one half mile east of I-25. But do you know the business that spent decades off Arapaho Road and Clinton Street, one half block east of I-25?
Colleges changing conferences for athletics seems like an annual tradition. It's been around for decades, and it has an impact beyond the colleges and the teams themselves. Just off Arapaho Road, east of I-25, is more than that one jewelry store. There's something whack about what's over there. No, no it's, it's called the WAC, the Western Athletic Conference. Colorado State and Air Force used to be part of the WAC, but left for the new Mountain West Conference in 1999. For two decades, the WAC, without those Colorado teams, remained headquartered in Greenwood Village until less than a year ago when it finally moved to Arlington, Texas. For 60 years, the WAC was based in Denver, even when their schools weren't in Colorado. And a lot of that has to do with being a central location. Uh, even after Air Force and CSU left, when Boise and Fresno State and Texas Christian and all these schools were in the WAC, Denver was still, still a central point for all these universities and a good meeting point. Before you fire off the emails, DU joined the WAC for one year in 2012. So that means for 13 years, the WAC stayed in Colorado with no team, and then for almost 10 years after DU left. Beware, though, when you poach schools or they leave as a conference, you might have to change locations, too. Larry, Curley, and Mo are the newest residents of the Holly Creek Retirement Community in Centennial. These stooges are robots brought on to help with staff shortages. <laughs> There's a lot of laughter here when people are dining. This is a great social time for us. Our dining is very, very busy. Almost everyone in the building comes to the dining room. We're all deciding what we're going to eat, but then the robots. And the robots are all over the place. They're coming here, they're coming there. I've been here 10 years, so we've seen a lot of changes, and I don't think you can beat the robots. So here are my robots here today. Uh, so Mo, Larry, and Curly. So are you trying to ruin us too? At first I thought, well, those are comedy people. They're kind of screwballs. You know, you're a little bit too bossy. <laughs> These little guys don't seem like screwballs to me. They're very efficient and helpful and kind. They are very polite. <laughs> Very polite, yes. So I'm, I'm starting to think maybe that I had a wrong idea about the Three Stooges from the get-go. I don't know. <laughs> and now I hear that they sing Happy Birthday. Happy Birthday to you. It's really hard to find staff in any industry right now, especially in, in the service industry. So the robots are, are a huge help with support. Because many of us as older people are a little afraid of all this stuff going on. But... I'm not afraid of Larry, Curly, and Mo. I love them. So that's my message. That was through the lens of Corky Shawl. Some One of them should have curly hair. One should have a bowl cut. Our feedback delivered by Marissa. Coming up next. Quite the cross-section of feedback. Kaylin writes in, my TV must be glitching. Why is next leading with a college football story? One, it's local. Two, it's news. And three, there's going to be money I'm going to need to follow. Bill, welcome back. I'm suffering this year. I'm a walking milkshake for mosquitoes. They love me more than I love them. Ditto. Dolores, about uh, Steve's story. At first, I heard your story about the trail being closed. I thought to myself, what a jerk the owner is. But after listening to the story, I realized what I've known for a while. People are jerks. All right, Dolores. And Alicia, my favorite feedback of the night. Marshall, you're killing it. You need your own show. Just don't tell Kyle Clark. I think I kind of just did. Sorry. We'll see you next time.